We're continuing on our study in Great Bible Events, and in so doing, we're going to be again in the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 5. So if you want to go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 5. Today I want to talk about, and I've titled this message, Partners in Life. You know, God created woman so that man w wouldn't go through life alone. And two, become partners in life, sharing and doing things together when they marry. And this is the way that God designed it to be. This is the way that it, it should be. You know, a man and his wife should, should be together in all things. They should go places together. They should go to church together. They should do their shopping together. They should set their household budgets together. These are the way God designed the family life. And as we continue as we talk about our great Bible events, I'm going to share a story about a couple. And we're going to talk about a couple here in the Bible that they came into some money. They came into a large sum of money and they came together as partners to determine what to do with this money. But first, let me share you about a modern day example of a couple that came into some money. In 2007, Don Harvey and his wife Joyce, they became multimillionaires in a hurry. Not that I'm condoning the lottery in any way, shape, or form, but these two people uh, won the lottery. Don Harvey was a long-haul trucker, and he had put almost two million miles on his truck when his engine had failed the very same week that he ends up winning the lottery. But now he's going to be ran, riding up and down the road in style because he won the $105.8 million Powerball jackpot lottery in Oklahoma with a ticket that his wife had bought. Now Harvey and his wife Joyce, they said their first, they said with these winnings they're going to pay off their bills, they're going to help out some family members, and then they might think about buying a new home. But they chose to receive the $33.3 million lump sum after taxes instead of, you can, you know, you get two choices. I can take a lump sum or I can have it paid out over 29 years. They decided to take the $33.3 million lump sum payment. Now, when you, when you ask Joyce about the story about the ticket winning, she says it was actually a quirky thing that she had won. She says because she'd always bought lottery tickets with the same numbers. But one day, she bought a ticket, and the clerk messed up, and the numbers came out wrong. So she decided to keep those numbers, and she used those same, quote-unquote, wrong numbers when she purchased her ticket in, at a shell station in Rolling, Oklahoma, that turned out to be the winner. She said that she was in absolute disbelief and shock when she checked her numbers on the computer and found out that she had indeed won the lottery. She says, basically, I just broke down and cried. The couple said that they were pretty satisfied with their life the way it was anyways and would have to think long and hard about what they would do with the money after paying off their bills. But they, they both said that they didn't expect their life to change very much. How many of us would expect our life not to change very much if we suddenly came into $33. million? But this couple said they didn't expect things to change very much for them. The truck driver, he'd been a truck driver all his life. He's 64 years old now. He said he didn't plan on stop working. He said, I've got to have something to do with myself anyways. I can't go fishing all the time, and I don't play golf. So he just figures he might as well just keep on working. He said he was going to indeed buy a fancier truck than the one he had had before, but he's not going to buy a new one because there's no sense wasting money on something that's going to depreciate almost immediately when you drive it off the lot. But Don Harvey and his wife definitely found themselves millionaires and into a large sum of money, $33.3 million, and that's after taxes, by the way. But back to the beginning of the story, what they said is they were going to help out family members. You know, you hear stories of people winning the lottery and all of a sudden family members start coming out of the woodwork. So we have to ask ourselves, we kind of got to wonder, do we really think, are they, how much are they really going to help out these family members and how much will they really do it? And it's not for, that it's for us to judge anyways, but if they, if they don't help out their family members as they said they were going to, what do we think that God might think of this? You know, we make promises to we make statements, and God takes us seriously. God takes our word serious. When we say things, God expects us to live up to our word. And when we think about most of the, I'll 
I'm never going to find myself winning the $33.3 million lottery because I determined a long time ago, I, I finally gave up on winning the lottery because I, I told my wife, I said, you know what, when I never buy a ticket, I don't know how I'm going to win. So I'm not going to win the lottery, so I'm not going to come into this kind of money, but we have to ask ourselves, what do we think that God thinks about the way we deal with the money that he does give us? You know, God may never see fit to give me that large of a lump sum of money, but what does he think about the way I use the money that he has given me? You look at Psalms uh, 59 and 11, and it says, I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the fields are mine. You know, see, God already owns everything. He already owns everything in this world. He doesn't need anything that I have. He already owns it. But because he owns everything, he is that puts him in the position of the giver of every good and perfect gift. That's what James uh, chapter 1 verse 17 tells us, that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. He gives us everything that is good in our life. God gives that to us. He gives us our life. He gives us our breath. He gives us our money. He he gives us our material possessions. Everything that we have that we count as good to ourselves is indeed a gift from God. So sometimes we have to wonder what he thinks about how we choose to use those gifts that he's given us. You know, in our text, when we go again to chapter 5, we're going to read a story about a man named Ananias. We'll call him Mr. and Mrs. Ananias. Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. We're going to read about them. And when we read this story, we find that it's not a very good account on these two people's part. It's actually somewhat of a frightening story to, to some. And when, I, when we read this text, I want us to think about what they did and what happened to them and how we can apply that to us today. Well, we're going to look at three different things that we can see. First of all, we see a conspiracy, uh, a conspiring in evil, a lying to God, and then a dying in suddenness. These are the things that we're going to find in this story. So first we see a conspiring in evil. We look in chapter 5 and verse 1, and it says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. We see Ananias here conspiring with his wife Sapphira. You know, they decided to work together. They plotted together. They planned together. You know, you think about it. You know, you had some, that's a precursor to an, another famous couple, Bonnie and Clyde. You know, you think about partners in crime. You, you can't help but think of Bonnie and Clyde. You know, when you think about them, Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow, they were notorious outlaws in, in the central United States during the Great Depression. And it, their exploits were known nationwide during this time. They captivated the American press. They captivated American readership. Everyone was excited or just wanted to know more about the story of these two people. They had become, during 1931 and 1935, which became known as the public enemy era, they kind of ran that era. And this couple and their gang were notorious for bank robberies. Clyde actually preferred to, to knock off small stores and gas stations. That was his preferred target. Now, when we look at the story, the, the difference is there. Bonnie and Clyde, they weren't really married. But you think about this couple, and, and uh, they got into a lot of trouble. And because of that, they died very early in life. Bonnie was only 23, and Clyde was 25. When you read about it, most historians will tell you that the whole reason Bonnie even got involved with Clyde is because she was in love with him. But from that moment on, she would remain loyal to, as his loyal companion as they carried out their crime spree all across America and ended up in their own violent deaths. But when we think about conspiring to do evil, do we ever conspire to do evil? How many of us here have ever conspired to do evil? I think all of us have, yeah. All of us have conspired to do evil because when you think about it, we're not as bold when we're by ourselves than we are with somebody else there to, to, to egg us on. You know, I, I remember a time in my youth is uh, on a scout trip. We were on a 50-mile hike, and we were walking through the woods, and 
And every single one of us had a big, huge box of matches. We were just playing with those matches the whole trip. We were lighting them on anything we could figure out to light them on. We ended up throwing them at each other. And it culminated in, we were passing by a pine tree that had this sap just seeping down it. And one of the scouts, I don't remember whose idea it was, I said, do you have any idea how flammable sap is? I said, let's see. Of course, we lit up this pine tree, and here it's starting to climb up the pine tree. Our scoutmaster comes running over, yanking his cap off, smacking at it, going, what are you thinking? Well, apparently we were conspiring to do evil together. You know, of course, we told them we were about to blow it out. We weren't going to let it burn down the forest or nothing. But uh, he wasn't too happy with us about that time. I also can remember a time as a teenager, as a, me and a group of friends were out riding our bikes, and we decided to stop in at, at the Whataburger. And we didn't have a whole lot of money between us, so we decided that, you know, Whataburger had free refills. So we decided to purchase one soda. And we took the one soda and we set it in the middle of the table and we all got four or five straws and connected them together and stuck them in there and sat back in the booth. And, you know, as teenage boys do, we, um, after consuming soda, we had not quite so pleasant noises coming, echoing from our mouths. And, Refilling our soda several times, uh, finally a manager came over and asked us to leave. And they didn't say we couldn't come back, but we couldn't come back and ever do that again, is what the manager asked us to do. You know, you think about it, young folks, you young people, you, you ever wonder, you ever want to know why uh, adults kind of give you that eye when, when you walk in the room and a group of young people walk in together? Well, it's because all of us adults, we remember all too well the way we were when we were teenagers. And, and we remember how much easier it was for us to get into trouble and how much easier it was for that trouble to intensify when we were in a group of friends. You know, by ourselves, we didn't get into that much trouble. But when we got in a group of our friends, trouble just seemed to find us. You know, we, we never really even remembered whose idea it was to begin with. But whenever we got into a large group of friends, there never seemed to be a shortage of stupid ideas. They always seem to come out of the woodwork. woodwork. Now, there always was a, a level head in the bunch that sometimes would squelch some of those ideas, but not always. Some of those bad ideas would get forward, and we would conspire to do evil. And we know that doing evil by ourselves is, is bad enough, but when we get somebody else involved, it just gets worse. It always gets worse. It, it intensifies the evil. It, makes it, it, it brings it up. You feed off of each other. Instead of doubling the pleasure, it, it doubles the trouble. It doubles the evil. You know, Psalms 101, 3 and 4 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. You see, David knew the idea of conspiring to evil and how it could compound itself. And he just wanted to stay away from that kind of thing. And when people have evil ideas and motives and, and want to get us involved, we need to quickly turn them down and turn away and walk away. Because people are going to invite you to do evil. And when they do, we really only have one choice that we, are, that we should make as followers of Christ. And I'm thinking that perhaps Sapphira, in our story, should have told her husband, she should have said, you know, honey, I love you and all that, but... I just can't go along with this plan of yours. This plan is, is ill-conceived, and, and it's not good. And why is it not good? Because of the second thing, they were lying to God. And we look, as we look farther in our story in verse 3, it says, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Lying to God is not a very smart thing to do. You know, once when Lord Monaghan, he's a great British surgeon, when he had finished operating before a gallery of, full of, of spectators, other distinguished visiting doctors and guests had watched this surgery, he was asked how he could perform so well 
was such a great crowd present around? And he replied to them, he said, you see, there are just three people in the operating room when I operate. So he says, the patient and myself. Of course, the questioner said, well, that's two people. He said, who's the third? Monahan replied quickly, he said, the third person is God. God is in that room. And no matter where we operate, no matter where we live, no matter where we work, no matter where we drive, no matter where we play, no matter who we have around us, whatever guests we might have, God is there too. God knows everything that's going on. Now, Dr. John Bailey made it a practice to open his course on the doctrine of God at Edinburgh University with these words. He always said, gentlemen, we must remember that in discussing God, we cannot talk about him without his hearing every word we say. We may be able to talk to our fellows, as it were, behind their backs, but God is everywhere, yes, even in this classroom. Therefore, in all of our discussions, we must be aware of his infinite presence and talk about him, as it were, before his face. Now, we go on also to a story about the president of the Moody Bible Institute. And he tells this story. He says there was a young man from, from school that used to take the streetcar to his classroom, to his classes. And one day, before the conductor could come around and take up the fare, he'd gotten off the trolley car, gotten off the streetcar to go to school without paying. And when he later realized this, he thought to himself, he said, that wasn't right. I'd gotten my ride. I'd taken the ride. I should have to pay the fare. So he goes down to the station. He finds the conductor, and he pays him the money. The conductor said to him, he said, you're a fool for doing this, for coming. He says, the young man says, no, I'm not. I says, I got the ride. I should pay the price. It's only fair. The conductor said, but it's my business to collect the money. But the student said, well, yeah, but it's my business to hand it to you. And then the conductor looked at him and says, I bet you go to that Bible Institute, don't you? And President Moody said when he heard this story, he said, I've never heard anything said about our school that made him more proud than that one simple thing. That they were known as being a group of honest individuals that would do the right thing. Now there's a preacher that also tells a story. This is a more modern day story. He says, I find myself selling my old shirts, used shirts, on eBay. Said I could take them down to the local thrift store, but I could only make it about $1.50 off these used shirts at the local thrift store. So I've been selling them, he'd been selling them on eBay, and he found someone who was willing to pay $8 for these used shirts. But as he started to fold one of the shirts that he was supposed to send out, he found that it had a stain on the cuff. And he tried and tried to wash it out, but it, he even tried using the shout and all the different stain removers, but that stain just would not come off the cuff. And at first he said, he thought to himself, well, the, this lady's already paid for this shirt. I could just send it to them. You know, you win some, you, sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. But then he said that God was telling him, he said, that's not the way people of faith are supposed to do business. The woman had bought this shirt for her husband, and she didn't know that it had a stain on it when she was willing to pay the $8 for it. So he told himself, he said, God's telling you, you have to tell her. So he sends this lady an email and says that he's really sorry. He said, I found a stain on the shirt that you have purchased that I did not notice before, and I cannot in good conscience sell you the shirt that I know to be defective. And I can send you your money back if you'd like. So, but indeed, she accepted the refund. And any of you that have ever purchased anything on eBay, you know that there's the seller feedback. And he didn't give it another thought after he sent back the refund, but he said a little bit later he found on his seller page the feedback that this lady had left. And the feedback said that this is, and she put in very bold letters, this is an honest eBayer. And her quote was, the way all eBay should be. So he said that, that feedback to him meant more than $8 could ever mean to him. You know, he, he could have, he may have lost eight dollar an $8 sale, but he saved his reputation as an honest disciple of Christ. Is your reputation as a disciple of Christ worth $8? Do we think that we act that way? How are we? Are we honest before God and men? Are we truthful? Because we know that God is in everything we do. 
And God sees everything that we do. And we need to make sure that we're honest. Because not only honest with our dealings with God, but honest with our dealings with mankind. Because God said, when you do it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. We need to be honest with everyone we deal with. But they chose Ananias and Sapphira, unfortunately, for their sakes, they chose not to be. And that brings us to our third point, the dying in suddenness. Verse 5 and 6 says, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. You know, this is the part that we don't like to really consider or, or, or sometimes even talk about. And that is that our society tries to gloss over. And that really is the judgment of God. God really still does judge. Just because we're in the grace age and he forgives sin doesn't mean that God's judgment is, is null and void and it's gone. God still does judge. Ananias and Sapphira, you know, we didn't read the part about Sapphira, but Sapphira comes in and lies too, and she passes into death right there in front of them as well. But they died as a result of lying to God. You know, Justice Gray, the Supreme Court, once said to a man who appeared before him in a lower court, this man had escaped the, his penalty because of some technicality, you know, some legal technicality, and I know sometimes it it probably irks judges sometimes as much as it does us to have to make those kind of judgments. But he said to this young man, he says, I know that you are guilty, and you know that you are guilty, and I wish you to remember that one day you will stand before a better and wiser judge than I. You know, the sin of Ananias and Sapphira was lying to God. And what was it, what was it all about? They tried to put on a front. You've you got to understand what was going on here. You know, Peter even told them, he said, it was your land to sell. Once you sold the land, it was, it was your money to do with what you wanted to do with it. So it wasn't the fact that they didn't donate all the money to the church. What their crime was, was coming before the church and donating a portion of the money and telling them that it was the whole proceeds from the sale. That was the true sin. They were lying. They were trying to put on a front. They wanted everyone else in that congregation to think that they were as good as they were. They were, you know, because the Bible talks about all everyone who had land sold it and brought their money before it, and they said, "Well, we don't want to look like we're any less of a Christian than these other people, so we'll we'll go sell our land, and we'll bring the money." But then they decided, "Well, we're going to keep some of it back." They were putting on a false front, a false religion, a false worship, lying to God. Do we ever try and put on a front for people? Do we ever try and give the appearance that we're better than we really are? Are we honest with everyone that we meet? Are we honest in God's presence about who we are? We think about it. Now, preacher Warren Wurns, uh, Wursby once said, he said, The sin of Annas and Sapphira, he was talking about a commentary about this, The sin of Ananias and Sapphira was energized by Satan, and that is a serious matter. If Satan cannot defeat the church by attacks from the outside, he will get on in the inside and go to work. He knows how to lie to the minds and hearts of church members to get them to follow his orders. We must remember that their sin was not in robbing God of money, but in lying to him and robbing him of glory. They were not required to sell their property, and having sold it, they were not required to give any of the money to the church. Their lust for recognition conceived sin in their hearts, and that sin eventually produced death. So what about this business of God striking them dead? Well, you know, it's kind of frightening, that's what it is, to think about that God's just going to strike you dead for your sin right then and there. We don't go around, normally we don't go around life fearing that God's going to strike us dead for committing a sin. But this is not the first time that God had caused the death of people because of their sinful nature. In Genesis 19, when God overthrew the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, he had told Lot's family to get out. And they were not to look back. And we all know the story, what happened there. Uh, Lot's wife, I guess she didn't believe God that she shouldn't look back. And she did. And turned into a pillar of salt and lost her life. 
And then in Leviticus 10, the, the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, you know, they offered unauthorized or false fire to the Lord, and they were killed for it. They lost their life for that sin. It sounds pretty extreme, and yes, it is pretty extreme to lose your life for a sin, but the judgment of God is a real thing. It means that God means what he says, and he'll do what he says. So what about the possibility of God killing somebody today? Is someone going to walk before the church and fall down dead? Probably not. But do you think that God, I think it's very possible that, and highly possible that some of the diseases and things that people are dealing with today is the judgment of God upon their lives and the decisions that they've made and their sins. I'm not saying that, that I'm not going to go off on the tangent like some religions would do and say every illness in your life is God's judgment. But I do believe that God uses natural means to judge the human race. All I say is we shouldn't try to test God to find out if he's going to strike us down. You know, Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 says, Wherefore we, rece we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, uh, a preacher, Vernon McGee, he related this story one day during one of his sermons about this same topic. And then he stopped and he posed the question. After he had preached a service about Ananias and Sapphira, he posed this question to his congregation. He said, how many of you have ever been guilty of hypocrisy, deception, lying, and pride since becoming true believers? And he, said, he asked the congregation to raise their hands if they had done so. And, and he paused for a while and waited. And he said, pretty much everyone in his audience raised their hand. He said they had been, at some point since becoming a believer, been guilty of hypocrisy, deception, lying, or pride. Which that was the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. And McGee said to them, he said, Well, man, what a crowd of evil people I'm ministering to today. He says, by looking at the sheer numbers of hands raised, if God judged everyone today the way he did Ananias and Sapphira, I wouldn't have anyone left to preach to. He said, but that's all right, because come to think of it, I wouldn't be here either, because I have done the same things myself. And I'd be right alongside with you. So what about us? I think perhaps most of us here, if not all of us, are probably guilty of a certain amount of lying, deception, and hypocrisy in our lives since we've become followers of Christ. So what's going to happen to us because we are guilty of these things? Well, Psalms 103, 8 through 10 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to to our iniquities. Listen, listen to that last verse again. He hath not dealt with us after our sins. God doesn't deal with us the way we deserve. We deserve his wrath and judgment. But he deal, deals, deals with us with mercy and grace. And we shouldn't take advantage of that. We should be thankful for that. And we should move on. And we should want to share that mercy and grace with everyone we come in contact with. Because it's only by the grace of God that any of us are saved. It's only by the grace of God that anybody that we ever come in contact with can be saved. And all we can do is live the best that we can. And when we do find ourselves taking down that wrong path, going down the path of deceit or hypocrisy, then we need to go to the Lord and we need to confess to him and say, Lord, I messed up. And once again, ask for his mercy and put our faith and trust in God to lead us through it, to get us past it. Because he's the only one. His grace is the only thing that's good enough to save us from the punishment of hell. And it's his grace, again, that's the only thing that's good enough to even save us from committing them again. We need his grace upon our lives to keep us out of those sins. 
So we need to ask him to give us those graces in life. He's given us the grace to save us. Now let's ask him, pray each morning for his grace to keep us further from any trouble. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer.